He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How many of you know exactly what that means? All right. So it's good that we are here, right, to explore this. Hello and welcome to the Love Key Church podcast, where we share our church's message of the week. My name is Heinz Winkler, and together with my wife, children, and our leadership team, we host Love Key Church here in Somerset West, online, and on this podcast. It is our mission to help you to encounter God align with His purposes, reign in life, and help others to do the same. We trust that you will find this message empowering, encouraging, and inspiring. Please share it with your friends and family and write a review for us. And a huge thank you goes out to those who have already done so. May you be thoroughly blessed as you listen to this message. We are busy with a series called Rain in Life, which I showed you earlier is, is one of our main values. I really believe that God wants all of His children to get to a place where we stand in the fullness of the authority and the role that we have in life. How many of you would love to live fully the calling on your life, to fully live the identity that Christ has put in you? Amen? That's where we all want to be, Right? And today, <clears throat> I'm going to speak on our next message, which is called The Keys of the Kingdom. The Keys of the Kingdom. And it comes from a very well-known scripture that we, one of our songs was just based on that we sang, Build Your Church. That They were singing scripture that I'm going to share with you today. All right, we're going to, we're going to kick off with, um, with this... Uh, this main scripture, then I'm going to invite my son to come and share something with you. And uh, then we're going to go into a bit of scripture, quite a bit of scripture actually. Um, and then I'm going to try my utmost to show you what I believe God has shown me about this. And I think it's really important. So I need all of you to put on your thinking caps and to put on your student caps and go with me on a journey today. Amen? All right. Our, our main scripture for reign in life comes from Romans 5.17. It says, For if by one man's offense, referring to Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Some translations say specifically will reign over sin and death in life. Now this is a powerful verse and the more I read it, the more I realize there's so much in this. And I'm going to try to show you how this links up with our verse today. Because we're going to speak about how to reign in life, one of the things that it means is we get to reign over death. We're going to talk about the keys of the kingdom, as I said. I want to ask you, has any of you ever received something significant? Um, if you, oh, sorry, let me ask you this way. If you have, someone told you you're going to receive this thing, and it sounds amazing. But maybe you received it and it didn't really measure up to the expectation that was created. Maybe someone was selling you uh, an idea or how amazing this was and then the substance of what they gave you <laughs> was not the same. Imagine you hear that you win the lotto and the, the payout is a thousand rand. Like really, 
that's not winning the lotto. So did, what, 500,000 people get the same numbers? What happened? Um, so that's just a, an idea. Or maybe you win a raffle with a stocked fridge. That's what you're told. And then when you get home and you open the fridge, there's a banana and nothing else. You were expecting a stocked fridge. You got something else. Now, Leon has a very funny story from a book that he's read of where a boy didn't exactly get what he was expecting. So Hello. Uh, I am Leon. So, so I have read a... Well, not recently, but I've read a book. It's called Middle School Escape to Australia. And what happens to the, in this book is this kid called Rafe Kachadorian. And he wins an art contest, which means he can go to Australia for three weeks, um, everything included, and it's entirely free, but, but, he, but he has to make art, and he has to draw pictures and stuff, and he has to display it. But he is like, wow, this is amazing, and he expects everything premium. Everything is going to be amazing, smooth sailing, nothing's going to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the mom and first of all the first red flag was his mom coming with him. <laughs> and then after she was wailing like um she was wailing like a wounded whale at the airport saying goodbye to all her loved ones. <laughs> he then realized that the sponsor of the art contest and the mayor of the town didn't exactly go premium on the plane tickets. So the first thing he heard when he came into the cabin was this. Good day, everyone. Welcome to all the EUIs, mates. Home, your captain, Ryan Mad Dog Porter. Today, we'll be flying at an altitude of like, real high. Due to the lack of space on board, there will be no meals served. But the cabin crew will hurl a bunch of stale peanuts at you. And you can fight out amongst yourselves. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I love that. Welcome to Aussie Airways, mate. <laughs> it's like, ooh, <laughs> let me get out. <laughs> Throw some stale peanuts at you. I love it. It's so funny. Oh, my goodness. So he had an expectation, flying first class, maybe with Qantas, but it didn't actually work out that way. In the same way that you may not get what you expect, it's also possible that you have something that you don't realize the value of. So sometimes we go into something and, you know, I, I'm expecting this and I'm getting that and I'm like, Ugh. but other times we actually have received something of great value, importance, and significance, and we don't realize it, recognize it, or we have become so familiar with it that we, we have lost the importance of it in our lives. In today's passage, we're going to see that as children of God. We have been given something extremely special and important by Jesus himself. And the question I want to ask up front that I want you to have in your mind as we go through this is, do I know it has been given? If I, and then the second question is, if I do know it has been given, do I know what it is? Because sometimes someone can give you something and you go, Thank you. That's nice. And you have no idea what it is. Have you ever received a gift like that? I've received like ornaments and I go, thank you. And I'm going, first of all, I don't know what it is and I don't know where to put it. <laughs> and then sometimes you look at a gadget. How many of you guys, when you look at a car's engine, you're the guy that goes, you know, the thing in Bajig doesn't work with the watch call it and the other. <laughs> I'm that guy. All right. So you. You, we all have our expertise, of, a field of expertise, and then if you go into another field, you realize you don't know anything, all right? So it's kind of like that. Maybe you've been given something that you look at and you go, I don't know what to do with this. 
Do you know what it's for? What its purpose is? And if you know what the purpose is, are you using it? So those are the four questions I want you to have in the back of your mind. So we're going to talk about the keys of the kingdom. Our main scripture comes from Matthew 16, verse 13 to 19. And I hope that you will see how the songs we sang today line up with this. And up front, I want to tell you that I, I'm standing before you once again very humbly, very aware that there are people that are way more clever than I am. But I really feel that the Holy Spirit has shown me something from these scriptures. And I'm going to try to take you on the journey that I feel God has taken me on. And I hope that at the end of today, all of us will feel empowered, encouraged, and inspired. Because we're going to get a revelation of what the keys of the kingdom actually are and what we are capable of with them. I hope that makes sense. I am trusting Jesus and the Holy Spirit so much that, that I will bring this across the right way. All right, let's read together. Uh, you can also follow along on the YouVersion Bible app event if you want. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. There's our main verse. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How many of you know exactly what that means? All right. So it's good that we are here, right, to explore this. Now I want to show you another verse. I'm going to come back to that and we're going to really get into it. But first what I want to do is read a couple of other pieces of scripture to set the scene. And then I'm going to tr try and show you what I feel God showed me. Revelation 1, verse 17 to 18. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, John is hearing a voice behind him. He turns around and Jesus is in an amazing way being shown to him. And he speaks. He says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. He just said to them, okay, I'll get into that. I'm just laying the foundation. I don't want to jump ahead. In this next piece of scripture, Ephesians 4, I want you to see how it's referred that Jesus had to descend for him to ascend. And then it speaks of the gifts and the roles that Jesus gave gives to the church. Remember, we're talking about the keys of the kingdom. Okay? Ephesians 4, verse 7, 7 to 16. This is quite long, but I feel we need to get the whole context to understand. But to each of us, but each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. 
and gave gifts to men. That line was in the song. He led captivity captive. Did you pick it up? All right. How do you lead the captivity captive? So if you're in captivity, what are you? You are bound. You're captured. All right. Now, if you lead captivity captive, you are taking captive captivity. So he is over the captivity that people are in. And he gave gifts to men. Now, in this piece in brackets is important. It says now this. He ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And, and it goes on immediately and says, And he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. The church world refers to this as the fivefold ministry. Why do they exist? Why did Jesus give these gifts? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. If you are a born-again Christian, you are a saint. You have work of ministry to do. You don't seem very excited about it. What is it also for? It's for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till when? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To be a, to, uh, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I mentioned this scripture when I spoke about raising royalty, that this, as parents, this is where we need to bring our children, to the measure of the stature of Christ. That, why should we get these gifts and why should it be in the church? That we should no longer be children. Talking about growing in maturity. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men. When you are tricked, you are lied to. In the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Once again, lying. But, contrasting it, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ He gives the gift so that we can grow up in Him. Do you see that? From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. This body is knit together and each one of us is a joint that supplies something. That is why I keep telling you, you're not here to warm a seat. You are here to serve the kingdom of God. And if you don't bring your gift, we miss out. The body of Christ misses out. If one joint is missing, it can't function. Amen? According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This church will explode with numbers if all of us take this seriously. It will. Because each and every one of you will realize, I'm a minister of the gospel. And I can change the world for Jesus. Amen? It would seem that the keys unlock the church leadership structure, as well as the training and the equipping of all the believers for the work of the kingdom. This is what Jesus is giving. The keys to unlock church leadership leadership structure and the training and equipping of the saints. In this next verse, 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to focus on the imagery of sowing seed. Are you with me? Are you guys still awake? Are you with me? All right. Tell me if I'm going too fast. 1 Corinthians 15. So also is the resurrection of the dead. You will notice there's a lot of speaking of dead and going to the nether nether parts, but It's not to bog us down. It's to show us something very significant. Stay with me. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. 
There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And so he's contrasting those who are still stuck in sin, still stuck in death of the first man. Remember our verse, reign in life. Okay, it connects with that as well. As, and as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. What did Jesus say to Peter? Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Here he says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Physical stuff cannot. He's saying it starts in the physical, it ends in the spiritual. Jesus is a life-giving spirit who gives life to our spirit beings. The kingdom is spiritual. Are you with me? I know this is a lot. You have no idea how this week has been. <laughs> Going through these things and just feeling like my mind keeps exploding. All right. In this next verse, I want you to focus on the source of the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Look at the source of the power. Now may the God of peace... This is him giving an exhortation in Hebrews. This is the final chapter of Hebrews. But listen what he mentions in his exhortation. He says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead. God brought him up from the dead. Who is he? That great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. If you take out that parenthesis in the middle, it says, Who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant. God brought up Jesus from the dead through Jesus' own blood, the blood of the new covenant. That's deep. All right. We're talking about the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What do keys do? They lock and unlock. All right? When someone gives you a key and you don't know what it's for, is the key useful or useless? Okay. So for us to receive the keys of the kingdom, that's great. Wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. But what is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom? If I don't know what the kingdom is, I can't use the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Do you see that? All right. One of the ways that Jesus explained to us what the kingdom of heaven is, is parables. He told parables to say the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. And there's many examples, right? In Matthew 13, there's quite a lot. You can go read that chapter and just stay there for months. It's amazing. I want to focus on three passages from Matthew 13. One where Jesus himself says what is the purpose of the parables. One about the explanation of the parable of the sower, and one of that's the explanation of the parable of the tares. Okay. Matthew 13, 11, Jesus says, He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So what happens here, Jesus tells these parables to people, and most of them go, Huh? Even the disciples. Then they go to him and say, please explain. And then he explains it to them. This is the one of the sower, Matthew 13, 18 to 23. 
Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the, everybody, kingdom, he and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown, remember sowing, sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For, the, for when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Matthew 13, 37 to 43, the parable of the tares explained. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed, so we just also heard about seed being sown. Who sows the good seed? It's the Son of Man. Jesus sows the good seed. The field is what? The world. And the good seeds are the son of the kingdom, sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. It's talking about people. People who receive the word of Jesus, understand it and live it out and produce fruit versus people who don't care or listen and ignore or don't understand it. Or they are bogged down by the cares of this world. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. Eternity, the decision of where you're going to spend eternity. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will gather out His kingdom, all things that... Ah, sorry, he will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. I mean, that is a couple of weeks on its own. But I needed to read that to you to get to what I hope will become clear today. All right, we're going to read Matthew 16, verse 18 to 19 again. I'm going to read this to you, and then I'm going to try to show you something practically. I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm going to try Matthew 16, verse 18 to 19. Listen to this now again with all these other scriptures we've read. We are coming back to our main scripture. Jesus is now speaking. He says, and I, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay? Notice these words, the name Peter, the word this rock, my church, gates of Hades, will not prevail, give the keys of the kingdom for binding and loosing. So those are our key phrases. Most people believe that this passage means that Jesus made Peter the leader or bishop of the church of Jesus, the first leader. That even though hell will attack the church, the church will stand. And that the keys of the kingdom of heaven are about spreading the gospel and declaring what is lawful and unlawful. How many of you have heard that explanation? How many of you agree with that explanation? 
Okay? It's not wrong. And I, I want to say emphatically, I'm not here to go against well-known theology or doctrine. But I feel that God has shown me there's more to this than just that. And that's what I'm going to try to show you today. I humbly propose that there's a different perspective that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us. And it is a perspective that is backed up by Scripture. And when it is applied, I believe it will give us a stronger and more confident position in life. Okay, I'm going to try something. So, I want you to imagine, this is Peter, and those are the other disciples. Roger, can you come a bit forward without blocking that lady? All right. Now, I want you to imagine this scene playing out in real life. Something that you may not know is that this place where they were walking, that place in Caesarea and Philippi, right close to where they were walking, was the physical place called the Gates of Hades that, went, that goes down to graves and the netherworld. They call it the netherworld. He chooses this exact place to ask them a leading question. Have you noticed that it's a bit of a leading question? Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? If it was a court case, we would say, objection, leading the witness. Because he's actually saying, it's more like when I say to Alona, 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 what's your name? <laughs> it's kind of like that. Some of you didn't get it, okay? <laughs> So they give him some answers. And then Jesus says, but who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. All right, now focus. I'm going to say his next sentence in a few different ways. Now, I want you to know that in the original Greek, Jesus says, you are Petros, which means stone or part of a stone. And then he says, on this Petra, which means rock, I will build my church. How many of you know that you can say the same sentence in different ways, and it will have a different meaning. It could be the tone of your voice, or it can be the way you gesture. I don't want to add anything to the Bible that's not there. That's not what I'm doing. But I want to show you something that I think can unlock something very important. Jesus says, you are Peter. And on this rock, let's say I'm Jesus. I'm, I'm playing the role of Jesus. You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Here's another way he could have done it. You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. This is another way. You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, the disciples. Or, one final thought, you are Peter, and on the rock of what you just said, the revelation that I am this Christ, the Son of God, I will build my church. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you, disciples. Come back to this. Can you guys see that? There are some theologians and commentators that lean towards the fact that the Greek says Petros and then Petra, that Jesus was not only referring to Peter, but that he was referring to what Peter said, the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. And there's others that believe Jesus is actually referring to himself. 
Okay? It is possible that there's something else happening than the church being built only on Peter. Can you see that? There's nothing wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to think it was built on Peter or refers to Peter. But I think Jesus is saying much more than just that. Okay. The other term we get here is he speaks about the gates of Hades. Now, in the context, for them, it was a physical place that he was referring to. Many translations go from there and they say he's referring to hell. And it is physically the, the doorway to the netherworld, the graves. Now, Jesus says he will build his church on this rock and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Why gates? This is the question that I feel, that I felt Holy Spirit put in my heart that led to this whole sermon. Why gates of Hades? Why not the hordes of demons will not prevail against it? Why not the armies of hell will not prevail against it? Why gates? What are gates for? It's to keep things out. Or to keep things in. Right? And you can lock it with a key. And unlock it with a key. Okay? Have you ever seen a gate attack someone? Have you? All right? Have you ever seen a gate attack something? But you have seen it protect something. You have seen it lock something up and prevent it from coming out. Have you seen that? Okay. Now, when you read this passage alongside with Revelation 1.18, Jesus says to John, I have the keys of Hades and death. I have it. So here's another option. What if Jesus was actually predicting what he was going to do on the cross? And in his death and resurrection. On this rock, I will build my church on my death, on my crucifixion, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Can you see that? Then the idea that he was talking about himself and the statement Peter made, instead of Peter himself, the man, okay, now remember, Peter, just after this, Jesus predicted his death. And Peter said, no, 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 you can't do that. He actually pulled him aside and, re and Peter rebuked Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan, for you want to do what pleases man. I want to do what pleases God. This happened right after this. You are the rock on which I will build my church. Hey, 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 I'll tell you how to do that. Uh, no. Then Peter proceeds to cut off a, a soldier's ear just before Jesus was arrested. And then he proceeds to deny Jesus three times. On this rock, I will build my church. Now, yes, Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. It's future tense. And what happened on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and Peter preached, and 3,000 came to Christ. So he, he preached the first sermon and got the first converts. So I'm not saying it's not true. I just think there's more to it than just that. Are you with me? I won't get many, I hopefully won't get any emails. But we can also see that Jesus going to Hades, like it says in Ephesians, descending to get the keys, it lines up. And what would he have to do to get the keys? He would have to breach the gates of Hades. A 
upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. <laughs> he went, I believe, this could also mean that he went to go before us as the church to breach the gates of Hades. So the gates could not prevail against Jesus if he was coming for the gates. Would you agree with that? So let me put before you the possibility that Jesus is the rock on which his church is built. We have this confirmation anyway from other scriptures that refer to him as the chief cornerstone upon which the church is built. There is other scriptural references. And the gates of Hades could not prevail against him as his blood, from Hebrews, as forerunner and example to the church. Jesus overcame death. Death is, Hades is a, is, a, is a symbol for death, eternal death and separation from God. That is what Hades represents. Okay? That is why the church always will be and always will stand, and that is God's plan for the world. And yes, the church needs to keep reaching into dead places and out to dead people to bring the light and life of Jesus to dead people. And dead because they do not know Jesus and have not been reborn. And dead because they are heading for eternal death. That is the death that Jesus has overcame. Amen? Now let's say that Jesus was only referring to the church and not to himself. This is still great news. We as the church do not have to think mainly defensively. We do not have to be on the back foot thinking, oh, the gates of Hades are going to attack me. Because gates don't attack. I think Jesus is showing us that because of what he has done and because of the keys that he has given us, we will not only, it's, it's not so much about withstanding attacks of the evil one as it is that we can go and get dead people from hell, from Hades, and the gates will not prevail against us. Can you see that? We read that passage and most people preach that passage and you feel, I need to defend myself against gates. I think God is showing us that that is not what this means. Because that would mean that gates are, are more powerful and more scary to Christians than, than they should be. It's a gate. It's not a gun. It's not a sword. It's not an attacking weapon. It's a gate. It's a way into the netherworld. It's a way into death. But what is behind it? Dead people who need to meet Christ, who need to come into the kingdom. Amen? Can you see that? All right. So we need to have this confidence that because of what Jesus did, as the church of Christ, we can breach the gates of Hades and help dead people come alive. Does that make sense? And finally, Jesus promises that he will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven and that we get the authority to bind and loose whatever. The word there is whatever. I went to look it up in the Greek. The Greek word says whatever. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this sermon here and leave this on a bit of a cliffhanger. Because I want to delve back into this next week. When we celebrate our first year, I believe God is going to show us something about these keys based on the parables that I read to you that will empower us and equip us as a local church to plunder hell and populate heaven. Are you up for it though? How many of you are, are less scared of the gates of Hades than you were before you came in here today? All right. Praise Jesus. Next week, I'd like to look at what it means in the context of the Bible, uh, as the Bible teaches about the kingdom of heaven through the parables. Because if we really understand what the kingdom of God is, we know what the keys are for, and we know how to use them. 
There's a lot of keys flying around right now. Keys of Hades, keys of the kingdom. What are these keys for? How do we use them? Because Jesus wouldn't give it to us as a fluke. There's purpose behind everything he does and everything he tells us to do. So, I believe God wanted to show us today that through what he has done on the cross, we are empowered, we can, be, we can know that we are victorious, and we can know that we have the upper hand. I think the church of Christ in general is cowering and not posturing and positioning itself strongly against the, the plans of the enemy. If you read Revelation, we win. We win. We have already won. And what we are experiencing is the devil's tape tracker. Okay? It's the biggest lie we can believe as the church of God is that we are less powerful than the gates of Hades, the powers of hell, the attacks of the enemy. He is scared of a church that knows who they are. Because we will roll right over him. We will crash those gates. I'm telling you, the enemy didn't want this message to go out today. This has been one of the most difficult weeks for me to prepare. Everything seemed to distract me, take me off my game. I had so many moments where I thought that I'm, I'm, I'm on the wrong track. And today, everything technical that could go wrong, went wrong. <laughs> this is an important message. This is a timely message for the church. It seems that we are in the worst of times. Remember that quote I read to you? It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. The worst part is pretty freaking bad right now. It seems like the world has lost its mind. There were still some people in the world that had like some idea of what is right and wrong, but it seems that that is out the window. And what is happening is that it's capturing more people behind the gates of Hades, so to speak. More people are captivated or in captivity of darkness, in captivity of lies of who they are. And we need to go and get them. Share the truth with authority, with the keys of the kingdom, to bind and loose. That's what we've been given. And next week we'll get a bit more into that, what that means. But I hope that this message has hit home for each and every one of us. So in, in, in summary, let us let us just reflect and respond. Not in summary, I didn't mean to say that. I want us to reflect and respond on what happened today. Firstly, let us celebrate and rejoice over the fact that Jesus triumphed over death. Physical death and spiritual death. He has, he's got, he went there, he, is, he descended, he got the keys, he ascended and he gave it to the church. That's huge. Let us honor Jesus as the rock on which the church is built. Let us realize that gates are there to keep things safe or locked away. But they are not weapons that attack. So realize that the church is not in a defensive position. We're actually on the offensive. And let us ask God to help us and go and save souls from death. Those who are captivated by death those who are heading for eternal death, we have a job to do. It could be someone in your family. It could be someone at your work. We have a job to do. Amen? All right. Let's take a moment and just close our eyes and focus on Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We honor you. We glorify you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. I thank you for guiding us and leading us. I stand humbly before you, so aware of how
dependent I am on you. Lord, I thank you for this revelation. I thank you for the encouragement that lies in it. And I, I ask you right now, Holy Spirit, that you will touch each and every person here, their spirit being, that you will touch them right now, that they will feel your anointing. Go deep into their innermost parts and bless them, anoint them, strengthen them. I pray that the truth of this word will shine through any lie, any preconceived idea, any traditional way of thinking. And that you will help us, Lord, to know who we are as the church of Christ. We are here to take ground for the kingdom to go to those who are dead in their trespasses those who are on their way to eternal death and preach the gospel to them and bring them into the church help us Lord to use the keys you've given us to use the gifts you've given us to do that I thank you that as I stand here before this congregation that I can know each and every one is a minister of the gospel, is called for the work of ministry, is a joint in the body of Christ and has an important share to bring to the body of Christ. And I ask right now that you will bless each and every one of us in knowing what that role is, knowing that it's significant, and knowing that we need to bring it and share it and build church together. I thank you for that, Holy Spirit. Help us to reign in life over death and over sin in our own lives and in other people's lives that we get to share this with. Bless us, strengthen us, and guide us. I pray for every man, woman, marriage, family, child, everyone in this church, that you will bless them, strengthen them, encourage them, inspire them, Show them your truth. Show them what you see in them and help them to walk it out. I love you, Jesus, and I love these people so much, and I thank you that we get to do this. Bless us, help us, lead us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. Please stick around for coffee and fellowship. We would love to hang with you, get to know you. If you want prayer, come and tell me. Um, me or someone else will pray with you gladly. Remember to join a connect group. Remember to make us a testimony video and send it to the email. Remember to sign up if you want to become a member so that we can acknowledge and make you a part next week. And please come to church next week. Venue to be confirmed. Keep your eye on the social media. Keep your eye on your email. No, it's been. All right. Have a great Sunday. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you Bye-bye. so much for listening to the Love Key Church Podcast Message of the Week. I trust that you had a life-changing encounter with God that will help you to align with His purposes so that you can be one step closer to reigning in life. And may you be inspired to share this with others. Have a great week and remember to listen again next week or catch us live online or come visit us in person. May God bless you and keep you, make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you, your marriage and your family. Bye-bye.